All right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Pam Lopez. I am the annual giving coordinator for the Ignite campaign and team lead for the LGBTQIA plus initiatives for FIU's Foundation Office of Inclusive Philanthropy. On behalf of our executive director, Maya McGill, we are so pleased that you have all joined us this morning for one of the many diversity, equity, and inclusion roundtables that we'll be hosting throughout the year. So again, thank you for joining us this year. Uh, we're, we're pleased to host today's roundtable in collaboration with an incredible group of FIU's Division of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, the Wolfsonian Public Humanities Lab, and the Center for the Humanities in an Urban Environment. When Liberty Burns, a documentary directed by Dudley Alexis, highlights the life and death of Arthur L. McDuffie. In December of 1979, after failing to stop for a traffic light and upon surrendering, Mr. McDuffie was beaten by police officers until he lost consciousness. That beating by multiple police officers caused his death. And the acquittal of the officers sparked a civil disturbance in Miami's urban core. The McDuffie riots ultimately changed Miami-Dade County and became a symbol of the city's struggle with race relations and its sordid history during the Jim Crow era. And today, as we say the names of Arthur McDuffie, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Durante Wright, and the countless others, we are recognizing another chapter in America's recurring tragedy. Today's round table is a necessary discussion and unfortunately, a timely one. To help facilitate the necessary discussions and to encourage healing in our community, FIU Foundation in collaboration with FIU's Division of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion, the Wolfsonian Public Humanities Lab and the Center for the Humanities in an Urban Environment will be hosting the screening of When Liberty Burns at the Black Archives Historic Lyric Theater on Saturday, May 15th and Sunday, May 16th, both at 4 p.m. and again at 6.30 p.m. The screenings are free and open to the public and prior to the screenings, there will be a community access event with food vendors, uh, blood pressure screenings, health information, and the list goes on. So please join us. While there is no cost to attend the screening, seating is limited as we follow CDC guidelines. Therefore, tickets are required to reserve your space. So please reserve your tickets today by going to eventbrite.com and typing in when Liberty Burns. But now on to our round table. We are pleased to have with us today Dudley Alexis, an independent filmmaker and visual artist. His body of work includes a vast number of short documentaries, including stories about the First Nation Miccosukee tribe of Florida made while he was employed by the Miccosukee magazine. He also went on to write, film, direct, and edit his full length documentary, Liberty in a Soup, completed in 2016. Liberty in a Soup tells the historic significance of soup jumeau, the national dish of Haiti which commemorates the island nation's triumphant independence from France, making it the first independent black republic in the Western hemisphere. His work on the Arthur McDuffie story began almost immediately after, but not at the exclusion of creating and exhibiting his fine art. T. Dudley was recently selected and featured in the Kingdom of This World Reimagined exhibition, curated by the noted artist, Edouard Duval Carrier, during Miami's 2019 Art Week as part of the prestigious Art Basel festivities. Our second guest is one of FIU's very own, Dr. Chanel N. Rose. Dr. Chanel is the Associate Professor and Coordinator of Africana Studies at Rowan University and specializes in modern American and African American history with an emphasis on civil rights, black power movements, conservatism, tourism, urban history, and the African diaspora. And please note, she's also the author of The Struggle for Black Freedom in Miami, Civil Rights and America's Tourist Paradise, 1896 to 1968. And may I note that also with us today is Terrence Cribbs Laurent. Mr. Cribbs Laurent is a cultural curator with a special performing arts approach. He serves as the museum executive director of the City of Miami Black Police Precinct and Courthouse Museum. His 2018 written work, The Right to Riot, is being reviewed for publication and was part of the National Organizations of Black Law Enforcement 2019 conference. 
Mr. Cribs Laurent is presently working on a new exhibition that brings into question community policing with urban neighborhoods where black and brown people are fragmented yet culture and language are primary. And last, but certainly not least, the notably esteemed Dr. Valerie Patterson. Dr. Patterson serves as the clinical associate professor in the public administrative programs at FIU Stephen J. Green School of International and Public Affairs. She teaches courses in, in human resource policy and management, administrative and governmental ethics, organization theory and behavior, as well as courses examining the contemporary race and gender issues. She serves as an affiliated faculty with FIU's African and African Diaspora Studies Program and currently serves on its steering committee. She's also an affiliated faculty with the Center for Women and Gender Studies. She's appeared on several television and radio programs discussing the topics of ethics and professionalism. And she's worked on several local initiatives focusing on the Overtown community, including three years on the St. John Community Development Corporation's Board of Directors, and for 10 years serving on the chair as a member of the steering committee of the annual Things Are Cooking in Overtown event. At this time, I'd like to turn things over to our moderator, France Williams, who is the Leadership Annual Giving Officer and Team Lead for Black Male Initiatives for the FIU Foundation's Office of Inclusive Philanthropy. France, please take it away. Thank you so very much, Pam, and welcome. Good morning, all. My name is France Williams, and I am energized and motivated to be your moderator here this morning. We have the esteemed panel in front of us, and I really want to set the tone and frame for today's conversation. Clearly, we're going to engage and focus on the documentary, When Liberty Burns, uh, by Mr. Alexis. And we're going to use that as really an entry point to talk about the historical frame of police and police violence in communities, communities of color. Importantly, though, we finish with an open dialogue of what role public institutions like our FIU can and must play to produce more equitable outcomes. And clearly in, in this heightened week, in the context of the recent uh, George Floyd verdict, we affirm our commitment to human dignity, human grace. This conversation is not for expediency's sake. This is an exchange of shared history to help us reflect and then come up with some equitable strategies. So as I often find that these democratic conversations don't have to be prescribed, we only have to listen and amplify others' voices. So with that, let's turn to our friend, Mr. Dudley Alexis. Hey Dudley, how are you? Simple question, how are you? I'm doing well, thank you for having me and I'm happy to be here and look forward to, uh, to having a um, really, um, you know, interesting conversation with you about uh, the subjects. And uh, if I can start you off with the first question, you actually had shared with us um, a personal reflection of what first led you to tell, um, retell Mr. McDuffie's story. And I wanted to kind of start from there, your own personal telling. Why was this important for you to tell him and maybe who in your life motivated you to tell it? Well, um, a friend of mine that I went to high school with, um, his name is Junior Prosper, um, who, you know, was, um, was, you know, was coming from work. He was driving a taxi, hit a light pole, and he's a taxi driver. And, and um, by the, he called a tow truck. By the time the tow truck show up, he, a police officer show up. He had an altercation with a police officer and a chase happened on I-95 and he was shot by the police after the police chased him. And, and what happened, and I, I see how the conversation was being framed uh, around knowing him, how kind of, what kind of person he was, and I see how the conversation was being framed around his death. And I started looking into the history of policing and Miami and the relationship the police had uh, with Miami. And it was around the same time there was a lot of um, in Miami like that, you know, like around like, you know, two, around that month, there was a lot of police involved shooting in South Florida. And, and um, the, you know, another guy, you know, I, I've seen him play. Um, he, I forgot his name now, the drummer, he on, uh, in Palm Beach, 
watch that also on the highway, same thing. So I started doing the research about the uh, the police and and um and um and in the history of black people in South Florida. And I came across the story of McDuffie. And, and I started reading a lot about it and, and saw how that story impacted Miami so much, but nobody, nobody knew about it. I started asking my friends, I started asking people that, you know, that I hang out with constantly and no one knew about it. But people, um, when I came across people that, you know, that's not from my generation that actually lived through it, and I mentioned McDuffie, they all kind of either a pause or that you know before they say anything or they don't say anything at all, and 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 you can still see the pain was there. So I, and I said and I said you know that is a story that, that needs to be told. We cannot let the story of um, of Arthur McDuffie just go away because so much of it you know be buried like that, go away and be buried like that. So it's because so much of it kind of shaped you know uh, Miami. Um, and how you know how they ch chose to talk about Miami after after McDuffie. So so that kind of what drove me to tell the story because I felt like you know this history was being washed away, buried, and 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 and, and in many ways I felt like you know it was the story of Black Miami that was happening too. So that drove me to telling the story. And if I may, I, I want to ask you one follow-up question before pivoting uh, to our friend Terrence. Um, you explained that hesitancy, right? That community hesitancy. People um, may not want to talk about it in the Black community because of the pain. Could you expand a little bit about that, you know, uh, that in the family uh, of well, Mr. I, well, no, the, the, well, the thing is, there's one thing that was, you know, when I was looking for people to interview, there's, there's a few things that was happening. There are people that, there was a lot of reason people did not want to talk about it. There are, there are Black leaders, you know, in Miami, they didn't want to talk about it. They didn't want to do any backlash or anything for them to talk about the story. Because, and I remember like, you know, somebody said, um, I, I, I own businesses in Miami and I deal with the city. I don't want to not be, you know, get any more contracts. This is this is like you know you're looking at the way that silence people trying to talk it and when the person was saying that it is you know I cannot hold anything against them you know and because those are the things that was keeping the story buried and there's also people that did not want to deal with the pain so and you have um, you have a lot of people that that what they experienced during the the McDuffie uh, incident um, did not want really to relive it, you know, um, and and uh, and and also the family. Uh, one thing about the family, uh, when I, tr you know, we tried to, um, my producer Femi and I, we tried to talk to the family. One of the things um, that was happening, they f they didn't want to respond to us because they felt a lot of time people come in and do interviews and talk to them. And nothing really happened, and they never. They felt like they never really tell the story uh, of Arthur McDuffie the way they wanted. They wanted to be told. So I had to sit down with them and reassure them. You know, I was gonna, um, I was gonna do, uh, you know, do a good job and do it justice. And 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 they were the first people that actually saw the documentary before I, the documentary went public. They were the one, you know. I um I drove to Atlanta, um, Atlanta um, um to Georgia. They live like you know right um what was the city again? <laughs> right like you know uh, south of Savannah. So I drove there um, um to actually meet with them and to show them the documentary right after. So uh, th that was th those were the challenges. Why people really did not want to talk about it and, and, and why the family did not want to, you know, was, was reluctant to sit down with us for an interview. Well, and of course, first and foremost, thank you for your candor. Uh, thank you for producing this film. Um, but I, you mentioned just so many great nuggets and I do want to get our other panelists in before we return to particularly that representation piece, um, language. But Terrence, um, coming to you and and your knowledge and expertise and experience, I wanted to connect a thread from what uh, Dudley had said 
keenly about, you know, keenly about the representation on the police force. Yeah. Could you really kind of describe to us um, as we begin in 1980, could you draw back by a few decades and really kind of tell us uh, a quick history lesson of the first black precinct and courthouse and why it was established in May of 1950? Yeah, uh, thank you, Franz. I really appreciate uh, once again to uh, FIU uh, hosting this very uh, challenging conversation. It does put us all in a very vulnerable space um, and most definitely doubly for making that lead way and when Liberty burns. Um, as a result of what Dudley has just mentioned um, is the reason why we, we really push for this to be an institution that preserves and uh, has that safe space for the conversation of what happened um, in law enforcement reflected in Miami. And so what you have here in, in the city of Miami, you have the one in the nation, the only one in the nation um, police uh, precinct that was actually built and designed for coloreds, for blacks um, that were in the 1940s, uh, prior to that, were not seeing agency. Um, they weren't making it to the jailhouse, right? They, were, they weren't making it to the courtrooms before then. And so you were seeing a number of deaths um, that occurred, murders, let's just call it what it is, murders, uh, that were happening at the hands of law enforcement or those that were deemed to be law enforcement. And I wanna make that very clear because um, there's a great respect that we have here and um, in this precinct um, for law enforcement, but we have no tolerance for the misuse and abuse of, of law um, in any capacity. And so that's what was happening in the early 1930s, 2025. As a matter of fact, um, if we go to slide four, um, I want to show you this slide. Um, and it actually um, pulls out what the idea of policing potentially looked like um, in order to be a police officer in the state uh, or in the city of Miami. Um, you had this. This is the actual uh, funeral of Sergeant Weaver. Um, he was killed in the line of duty. And if you look very closely, you will see um, men with white hoods regalia. Um, it was not uncommon to see individuals wearing these type of um, garments, Ku Klux Klan members, um, that were members of the police department. Um, policing, thank you, uh, policing back in that day prior to our first five, which is slide two, um, um, be, be prior to our first five, um, we, we didn't see agency. And so it was very difficult, even with these officers, they weren't allowed to be called police officers. They were only able to patrol um, in the black community, which spanned for those who are in Miami from Coconut Grove to um, Liberty City. It was very long, dense space and they patrolled on bikes. So they weren't even given cars. So even by in implementing these black officers that couldn't be called police officers, were called patrolmen who did not go to the academy, um, many of them died in the line of duty because they weren't trained appropriately. We are talking about after World War II, so we do see um, a number of opportunities that were granted to the police um, during that time, but none of that played a real strong part um, earlier in the days, right? So giving these officers an opportunity to actually patrol the colored communities save lives. We saw d diminish in, in crime, you know, in the police department, uh, I mean, in the community um, where these officers were serving these people, right? They were actually seeing them come to court, come to Judge Lawson, the first black judge in Miami. And we saw them come to court and that made a big difference. So the, the being able to actually see people who represented your culture and understood you as a people made a huge difference in the, um, in the agency of, of what we saw in the, in the police in Miami. Well, Annie, thank you. And, and I know I had one other follow-up because you actually said it on the, the pre-call. Could you explain that percentage and drop? So to, to better frame that, once the institution of black patrolmen, but not black policemen here in Miami, there was a reduction in crime, reported crime, yeah. uh, by a pretty high percent. And what was? 
it's so we are fortunate to have what is called these red line memo letters and so it takes it out of the context of it being oral history now we actually have written history and so the, we see um chief headley who many of us are aware of when the looting starts the shooting starts that comment came out of um they mention in these reports where crime reduced um over 200 percent now i must admit because these officers were um, being supervised by whites um, there were a number of times where they would do um, illegal shakedowns within those communities and those communities of color. But the idea of just community being able to see their own, um, someone who was not trying to kill them, but trying to help them um, and to reduce crime made a big difference. Um, and so as a result of that, you had other states, you know, Alabama, um, Georgia, they were reaching out to Miami as the premier space to say, hey, what are these colored officers doing? How Im impactful really are they? Um, and there were strategic um, plans in place, right, for implementing these black officers. You wanted them to be of a certain demeanor, you know, um, even though they didn't go to the academy, they wanted them to have certain elegance about them. Um, they had to be able to wear their uniform only on duty. They were not allowed to wear their uniform outside of duty. So there were a number of stipulations that were put in place for these officers, uh, but most definitely made the difference in life. It was a life or death situation. Well, and, and thank you so very much. I yeah. learn each and every time um, when, when we gather around this table, and I think because we're here in the historical frame, I, I want to pull in Dr. Chanel Rose uh, before then uh, pivoting to our to our colleague, Dr. Patterson. But Dr. Chanel Rose, after you hear the primer of, of Dudley, of Terrence, could you reflect a little bit about, um, we, we started in 1980, we got all the way to 1920s and, and understood a little bit about that development, but take us back just a, a bit. Why? You know, Miami and this need or this having a presence of the first uh, black patrolman in Miami, it seemed like it could read like a really progressive movement, but could you kind of take us back to maybe the 18, 1890s and 1900s and set the stage of why this happened? Oh, and uh, in fact, you are on yeah. mute. Sorry. So yeah, I mean, I think, you know, um, as we know, you know, from the inception of Miami in 1896, um, under who would become the third mayor, John Sewell, that, you know, African-Americans were needed to help essentially, um, as they called them, the 150 uh, black artillery men, as he referred to them, were needed to incorporate the city. Uh, but even though they were um, used to incorporate the city, from the city's inception, the, the rights of um, Bahamian descended black people, the rights of native born African Americans have, have never been, right, those equal to um, native, um, you know, white Miamians or others coming to, to the city who were, not, uh, who were not black. And so I think, you know, when we think about, so, so how does this happen or how, how do we kind of go from, um, you know, the 1920s um, into the 80s, but, but what is the pattern before that? I mean, I think, and I maybe mentioned this, you know, in our last great discussion that you, you, the, the, one of the reasons that Black nationalist Marcus Garvey's Universal Negro Improvement Association was so attractive to um, Bahamians here, to, to African Americans here, even though Bahamians were the, the main um, members of that organization, was because of the racial climate in Miami during the late 1800s and the early 1900s, because of police brutality, because of Klan violence, because of emerging Jim Crow segregation. And so, you know, the, the UNIA's focus on race pride, on upliftment, on black manhood and black womanhood, that um, these things were seen as in many other parts of the country and the world where UNIA chapters were, were seen as a direct um, response to the, to the white power structure and the racist um, discrimination and treatment of those who were here. But part of its demise was because of FBI surveillance, 
who worked with local police forces, right? Um, and so, and who worked with members of the, the Klan and other white supremacist groups to suppress these organizations. So that that history um, is there. If, if I can, I would like to say a little bit more about just the evolution of policing in Miami, if that's okay to kind of add Please. a little bit more context to that. And I would just add that, you know, as um, Terrence, you know, pointed out uh, so, so, so clearly, in a way, and to your point also, France, Miami becomes this model, right? You have through interracial cooperation and private no negotiations, the swearing in of five black police officers, right? In 1944, which was seen as unprecedented. The all, um, the all quote unquote Negro court. Um, and, you know, in 1950 under Judge Lawson that he mentioned was seen as unprecedented and a model, even though it was within the confines of Jim Crow, right? The colored police precinct, right? Like, like these things, um, and, and even I think by 1951, when city officials were ra raving about Miami you know, having 41 uniformed black officers, which was like, I think the largest police force in the South at that time. And so it reinforced this kind of progressive tourist image, right? This model for other places to emulate. And to Terrence's point, I think some of the positive things that come out of having that police representation in the black community were things for other places to look at. But the city did not escape, right? As we know, it did not escape the sordid history of police brutality, against Blacks, the kind of strained relations between law enforcement and the Black community that was endemic to most parts of the South and the country. You know, Miami also confronted those same issues, right? Black communities in South Florida were over-policed and unprotected. And so I would just say, you know, thinking about the Miami Police Department in the 1920s, right? It developed a national reputation for brutality under the um, notorious Howard Leslie Quigg, right? Who admitted to torturing and even murdering black people and was an open member of the Klan, right? I, you know, during this time, I think in 1928, police officers, including Quigg, right, were indicted um, as part of a grand jury investigation. And, and so he had to actually resign, but then he was reinstated, right? The same police, um, uh, chief was reinstated after resigning and reinstated in 37, I think until like 44. And then I would just say, as Terrence said, right, Walter um, Headley, who replaces Quig, carried on that same legacy um, in many ways, right? I think of the, the Carver Village bombing in 1951 that I'm sure many panelists are aware of. And police chief Walter Headley blamed it on communists, right? Said that, you know, it was communists who bombed um, the, the, the apartment complex, not members of the Klan. It was communists who were getting blacks to move into uh, these, these buildings. And then again, I think, you know, in the wake of the Watts rebellion, Headley adopted, you know, the tactics of, you know, including shotguns and dogs and the get tough policy. And so he really implemented, or as we saw in other parts of the country, this strong law and order policy, right? That declared war on crime and these kind of new stop and frisk practices that he openly acknowledged and had no problem stating was aimed at young black males. And so as Terrence said, right, he famously said, you know, we don't have the kind of issues that are happening in other parts of the country in the 60s because the people here know that, you know, when the looting starts, the shooting starts, right? So you have that, I mean, I could go on, I'll stop here, but there's a long history of um, police aggression and brutality when you look at the evolution of policing in Miami that we don't typically associate with the city, not only because of its tourist reputation, but because of some of the things that Terrence pointed out where it was actually viewed as a model. So that that, that disconnect there, I think, is, is really important to recognize. And I really, you know, thank you for underscoring that, that differentiation, because what looks progressive in the 1950s is really set upon a very unequal, a very exploitive system of the 1890s, 1900s. And one name in particular, uh, I'm actually going to get ready uh, to pivot to over to Dr. Patterson, but one name that jumped out in your book that I still think about, sadly, from time to time is Herbert Brooks. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, if, if I could maybe press you for uh, 90 seconds, I know that's quick, but a 90 second telling of, of Herbert and how Herbert may actually fall in line with, with George Floyd and some others. Uh, and then... 
did 90 okay. seconds and I'm going to pivot to Dr. Okay, I know, I'm going to try and, because there's so many layers to the Herbert Brooks thing, but I'll just kind of give the very short version. So yeah, so Herbert Brooks, um, a Bahamian Black man accused of uh, sexually assaulting a 55-year-old white woman, right? And he actually took refuge in um, Colored Town uh, because, you know, once you're accused as a black man during this time, then clearly, you know, the, the, the lynch mob kind of gathers and he knew his life was at risk. And so actually, and this is where it gets a little complicated or more nuanced, um, members of the colored the colored community or board of trade um, who were African American um, actually, you know, helped in apprehending Herbert Brooks. And based on the, the records other scholars have written about this, the assumption was that they believed that if they um, handed him over, that he would get a fair trial as opposed to letting um, a lynch mob, uh, you know, carry out their own form of justice. But then there are questions about that because considering the context, the whole Bahamian African-American dynamic comes into place. And there are those who would say, you know, at that time, you know, giving him over to the local police force, they must have known that that could have, you know, could lead to um, risking his, his death. So that kind of gets complicated. But long story short, once he was now in custody of the police, um, they agreed to move Brooks to um, uh, on a train to Jacksonville, and um, he had already been labeled, I should say, by this way as kind of you know Herbert Brooks, the, the Negro rapist. But he never made it to Jacksonville, right? Uh, according to I guess you know Miami Herald reports, he jumped right now while restrained and seated. He jumped from a moving train to his death, um, kind of bashing you know in his own brains on the tracks. And so, you know, Bahamian um, Blacks in Miami were not, you know, taking that story. They did not um, believe that for a second. And so you see it, this, this somewhat of a division where, you know, over, I think, 400 Bahamians came together and were protesting and it almost led to, um, you know, a riot or rebellion in response to what had happened to Brooks. And they not only blamed the, the police, but they also, it, it, it exacerbated tensions between Bahamians and African-Americans because they blamed um, those group of, of, of African-Americans who were part of the, the colored border trade and others for um, being, you know, or contributing to to his death. So they had to bring out the National Guard um, to kind of offset, um, you know, what could potentially become a huge racial explosion. And so, yeah, that's one example of um, someone who was allegedly, right, um, accidentally killed, um, but many believe that this was, you know, just a, a lynching of a different kind. And, you know, effectively, the sense of being in restraint on, you know, in, in route. And then I think I had read in your book, it was suicide or labeled suicide. Right, right. So just the very sort of legacy of calling it one thing and, and it actually right. being something yeah. else. Right. But I, I mean, think yeah. it, to, to get our, our, our good friend, Dr. Patterson in, yeah. um, you know, Dr. Patterson, we have now started in the 80s. We've gone all the way back to kind of explain a little bit of how we got here. But now I'm, I'm going to ask you to be candid about your own personal experience uh, and, and any reflections really that you have in your position. Um, but my question is your personal experience of that 1979, 1980s trial of the officers of, uh, who had killed Mr. Arthur McDuffie. Could you kind of tell us what, what that was like from your first person perspective? Right, so, so um... It's, it's interesting to, to, to think of, uh, to sort of consider the um, um, Terrence's um, overview and, and also Dr. Rose's overview. And, and it just sort of sent me to, to think about other memories, right, of my experiences with policing growing up in Miami. And, um, and, and so we, you know, we had had uh, previous cases of, of sexive use of this excessive force that resulted in, in, in riots. And I remember one clearly, uh, one uh, image, I, I grew up in Coconut Grove and I lived on Grand Avenue. And, um, and so my house faced the, this 
Grand Avenue, which is the, the, the main drag in Coconut Grove. And, and I remember during one um, um, incident of a rebellion, like observing law enforcement, it, Carl Gable started right across the street from where I lived. And I remember law enforcement, like an officer getting out of his car and getting on the hood of his car with a rifle and pointing it at a young black man walking down Grand Avenue and telling him that he better get off of the street, right? And so, I mean, these are sort of examples of, 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 of excessive force that we witnessed. So then moving forward to, to um, the McDuffie incident, you know, when, when, when uh, Ms. McDuffie was, was killed, um, just shock, right? Um, as the story unfolded and, and we read about it and, and, and we heard about it, I was a young adult at that time, just shocked at the incident, what occurred. And, and then so kind of um, anxiously awaiting the justice, right? Justice related to this incident. And then, you know, being at home and hearing the, the verdict, and again, being sort of flabbergasted and, and uh, thinking, um, like, really? You know, so, so this was, especially in African-American communities, collective sort of um, angst and trauma mm -hmm. um, associated with this, this verdict and, and wondering, you know, where, where is the justice? But, but, but not really thinking in my head um, that, that what would unfold, right? And so, so you, I mean, the question sort of focuses on when Ms. McDuffie was killed, but I want to then sort of, I want to also talk about the, the rebellion and the riots with the, the um, uh, once the verdict was, was, was rendered. And, and so what sort of stands out, what stands out to me was the anguish and grief of his mother, mm -hmm. you know, once the verdict was announced. And again, trauma on top of trauma, mm -hmm. right? For for us and 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 uh, the black communities here in in um, in, in Bay. Um, I lived in the city of Miami at, at the time, and while I grew up in the West Grove, I had moved to uh, further north. To North Grove, but my grandmother um, was living again on 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 Grand Avenue, and I will never forget. Um, as you know, while Liberty City was where the major um, incidents occurred, uh, deaths, um, um, damage, um, and destruction, that there, there were in Black communities around Miami. There, there were people who, who had taken to the streets because they could not believe uh, in, in what the, the verdict and wanted to see justice, right? And, went, and, and we're looking for an outlet of some type, right? Because, uh, the, you know, clearly um, during that time, and I think that, that um, Nicholas Griffin and his, his Year of Dangerous Days well, you know, sort of talks about these three uh, confluencing events happening at my in Miami at the, the same time uh, with the and and so um, my grandmother calling me and and just being uh, just in fear because of the the rioting that was taking place right there on on her street right, right on Grand Avenue where she lived. And so um, that time, you know, just, just the, the thinking that while there was, Miami was definitely a place that was becoming more and more diverse, that there, there, there were tensions, right? There, the tensions remained across the multi-ethnic communities. And so, um, and, and thinking about, again, going back to my own knowledge of uh, and my own personal experiences with with law enforcement in the in the late 70s, 
um, while growing up as, as a teenager in, in Coconut Grove, um, we had officers, Miami, city of Miami police officers who patrolled the, the, the Grove, especially the, the, the Grand Avenue section. And I, I worked at a community pharmacy. And, and you talk about this, this, they were black officers, right? We got to know them really well. Uh, we interacted and we engaged with them, and and um, and so the the kind of the early days of this community or community oriented policing in that neighborhood in Coconut Grove took place. I, I mean, in in my family, I I knew um, black police officers, so I had that interaction and that engagement and 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 that knowledge, but also relationships. So again. This made um, what happened to Mr. McDuffie even more traumatic because I could not imagine those officers who, who I knew, who, who we had for patrolling um, the Grove on Grand Avenue, engaging in um, that, that kind of uh, use of ex excessive force. But again, ultimately sort of reflecting the vulnerabilities, right? The inequities, the disparities that existed for um, Black people in Miami. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, half of me wants to say, I'm so sorry that you had to endure that and, and go through it. I can only imagine fear of your grandmother, you know, contacting you, but. At the same time, thank you for, for sharing your own experience because I think it gets us to a, a point where um, I wanna pivot a little bit, draw back Dudley, and then maybe even make this a little bit more conversational because we get to a point of, in 1980s, this being a critically important moment in, in Miami history. And now just in 2020, here in 2021, reflecting on George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, um, sadly, other names that add to the list. But I want to connect the importance of why even 50, you know, even, I should say, just uh, 40 years ago, just 60 years ago, these were the realities that we faced. So, so Dudley, uh, given that we understand how critical representation was, language, as you had, had even indicated, was powerful, just asking you quite quite honestly, what is the emotional response that you receive or you have after already kind of going to advocate for the friend that you lost, um, witnessing and bearing witness to, to Mr. McDuffie's murder in that story? So here in today's moment, you know, can you just sort of reflect on how you feel and, and any connections that you draw between Mr. McDuffie and where we stand today? Mm -hmm. Um, let, let's talk about like a little bit about the verdict that came in with the, from the Chauvin case. Please. And mm -hmm. but to me, when when that happened, I really didn't know how to feel because I don't know why I should celebrate something that should be guaranteed to you know for Mr. Floyd. You know, justice. That's something that should be guaranteed for him to have, and I'm celebrating something that should have been. I don't know. I don't know how to explain that. I, I don't feel like, you know, it was a need for me to celebrate. It was like, it was a time of reflection more than anything to see what that moment actually mean for me and when, uh, how, what that moment actually mean. That's, that's, that's how I see it. Um, one thing I always say to people, um, the police is the last thing I always look at because the police is the end of what, of the bigger problem. The, the police is just protecting something uh, about in that society, which is like white supremacy. That's what it is it's doing. So, you know, if you're gonna keep looking at the police and the police, the police, and you're not looking at the major problem that's feeding the police, that's allowing them to grow and giving them that, um, uh, that power, because it's like the power that they get, it, they, they get it from the, the society that, that is allowing them to do it. And uh, for when we look at 
um, you know, when I remember Trayvon Martin, you know, you have a young kid that was stuck, you know, because that was one of the, the first story that really, because I, uh, he's from Miami Gardens from, uh, he went to Ives Dairy. So he's from Miami. He's a Miami kid that just left with his father and did not come back. And that story really, that's the moment I think a lot, I, you know, when you went to the trial, you have a young kid that was being stuck by somebody else, a grown man. And, and the, you know, imagine that, you know, you grew up, tell, you know, they tell you to be aware of strangers, especially strangers that are following you every step you've taken. And, and then Trevon was not seen as the one in danger. You know, so it goes to show you the bigger problem is how they, you know, um, you know, how that the society allowed those moments to happen. And, 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 and I feel like, you know, the, it's not, you know, and, and sometimes they, they make it seem like it's a burden for black people. I'm, I always say I'm trying not to be a victim to white supremacy, but it's not my, the burden is not on me to change, you know? So that's that's how I've been uh, uh, pretty much, I've been seeing those moments has been, that keep happening. And, and I just hope, uh, you know, I don't keep having those moments in the future, you know? Yeah. Franz, can I, can I add to what he's, um, because I keep hearing it and I think that um, we, we don't want to miss miss the point that there we have what is called state sanctioned violence yeah. and i know many of us may not really um have a clear understanding of that but dr rose mentioned it she she laid it out basically you have a system that provides the support that allows for things to continue to happen to certain groups of people um uh, at the uh, um, graphical studies frameworks identify, you know, how blacks, um, you um, redline letter, you know, I mean, um, redlining, how redlining was used in the brown and black communities um, as a way of keeping them from funding, as a way of keeping them from growing. Again, that is a state sanctioned violence, right? Violence not in the physical, but violence in the financial that then alludes to violence in the, in the physical, right? And so you have these, you have practices of policing, understanding the foundation of policing, of um, watchmen and, you know, going out and getting slaves and protecting land and property, understanding the ideological uh, mindset of many police officers is that Blacks were property. And you would assume, well, those people are gone, Terrence. Those people have gone and dead. And But the practice of anything becomes a permanent imprint. And it becomes this passed on generation. And and I and I would hearken to our brothers and sisters, um, even after we have the um, the Cuban um, um, exodus, you know, or, or the um, when you have that in the 1959, you know, it it changed the trajectory of Miami. It forced blacks that were here to feel inadequate now, right? Because you had all of our Cuban brothers and sisters coming over. They were assuming the jobs and the responsibilities. They they moved in and they took political positions, right? And then they started implanting things that almost resembled, if not resembled, what we were seeing in whites. And so you have uh, um, the Marion boat lift that, that happened right at the tip of the 1980s, right? So you're talking about all of this um, tension that keeps drawing up, right? Trauma that keeps occurring, that is not being resolved. And although we get, you know, like I tell people, I was excited to get into President Obama, but it didn't move me to ideals that we were, we've arrived. And I know for some people, now that you've gotten a black president, you've, you're there. No, now that we've gotten a, a, a justice system that is said guilty on all three charges, it doesn't bring any solitude because we have so many that have not. You know, Mike Brown, you know, we mentioned Trayvon Martin, Mike Brown, you know, what at what point does policing look at our boys and girls as children? 
and not as men. You know, you, you're looking at 16 and 15 year olds and calling them adults, you know, and so we really want to start thinking about that and the state sanctioned violence that comes along with that. And Dr. Brown pointed, I mean, Dr. Rose pointed that out so well, and it keeps coming up and I had to just toss that in there with this. And can I, can I add to both comments that um, Terrence and Dudley have made about that? And so, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think two things that I think of, one, um, you know, re regarding the Cuban um, black relations, Yes, we think of the Mario boat lift, which you know um, eclipsed a lot. It happens right around the time of the the McDuffie incident. But prior to that, right, we know post nineteen fifty nine, you have waves of Cubans coming in, and I think even after the U.S. Um, I guess Civil Rights Commission or the the report that was done to investigate why you had um, this civil disturbance in nineteen eighty. And they pointed to right some of the things that we're not surprised by: deplorable housing, economic exploitation, right, black um, bleak employment um, prospects. But they also talked about you know the the the, the economic competition between um, Cuban exiles and and, and African Americans, but particularly. African Americans feeling like, and, and rightly so, that the federal government had provided uh, resources and, and access to, 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 to housing that many African Americans didn't have, um, education for, for exiled children, uh, financial support, the list goes on. So while the Black community has been fighting, right, tooth and nail, trying to get um, many of these uh, services support, right, so that they can. Um, so they can redress much of the historical inequities that 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 compounds many of these issues that we're talking about so even before 1980 you can look at between you know let's say 68 and 1980 after uh the republican national convention in 1968 and many of the same reasons it's sparked by interactions with with police right it's, it's sparked by police aggression but it's it's you can't look outside of all of these other things that are happening and so to bring it to today i think the same argument is being made that yes whether you see it as justice or not, or a relief or not, as far as the verdict, but the work still needs to be done, right? That there are these larger issues about policing and police reform or abolition, or you know, different ways that that Black communities are confronting all kinds of of of, of issues and inequities that can't um, we can't just kind of sigh of relief and then not think about all these other ways in which that work needs to be done. And so the last point I'll make to the, to that same issue about state sanctioned violence and about uh, the points that Terrence was making about white supremacy, you often hear a lot, right? This kind of this de debate and division between, you know, well, you've got good cops and bad cops, or, um, you know, you have, you know, a few bad apples, but there are many good apples. Like there, there's kind of this divide between those who are saying, well, no, this is systemic, that this is part of police culture, that this is something that we have to deal with on a grand scale. And others who are saying, well, no, you know, clearly even using the, the verdict, right? That shows that the criminal justice system works. That shows that, you know, when you got those few bad, bad apples, we take care of it. And so there's a divide between that. And I would just use Miami as an example to say that, you know, when talking about um, systemic issues within the police department and not just this kind of one bad apple. And that's not to say that you don't have good police officers. So I, I want to be clear about that. But I'm saying when you have a systemic problem, everyone is in some way um, indirectly or directly affected by that. So in 2002, right, the Department of Justice investigated the Miami Police Department. They were investigating them for a pattern of excessive use of deadly force by firearms, right? Police shootings not properly investigated. Then again, in 2013, right, the Civil Rights Division of the Department of Justice investigated the Miami Police Department again, right? Same issues, excessive use of force, right? Police shootings. Um, protection against uh, unreasonable seizures, like all of these issues. And then in 2016, right, the DOJ agreed to a monitoring um, settlement where they would actually monitor the police department. And it's only, I think, maybe this year, right, February maybe, um, you know, that after, you know, decades of a string of deadly police shootings that the US department finally, 
and kind of formally ended its monitoring of the city of Miami the police department. So when people say, you know, it's, it's not systemic, it's individual cases, it's like, well, you know, you have a list of DOJ investigations of the police, and we can talk about Ferguson and DOJ investigations. I think now there's a call for a Minnesota DOJ investigation. So I think, you know, we have to look at, wait, this is not just, you know, black folk just claiming institutional racism and white supremacy. Like there, this is documented that there have been investigations into the system and culture of policing in some of these departments that has to be addressed. Yeah, the data is there. Yeah. Yeah. The data that supports the structural inequities, the systemic racism, the data is there. I wanna I wanna tell a story of one of the stories from one of the subject that interview I came across. You know, uh, he did make it in the documentary, but you know, on um, we, you know, I was filming him going around Liberty City. He grew up in Liberty City. I, and he said he, um he's a Vietnam vet now. Uh and you know, and and he and I told him how um how did he end up being in Vietnam? He said, I got arrested so much, the judge gave me a choice. Either do I go to Vietnam or do I, you know, go to jail or go to Vietnam? So I chose Vietnam. I said, how many times did you go to jail? I was like, oh, I've been going to jail all my life before, before I went to Vietnam. Uh, and I said, the, then he tell me the story of the first time he went, uh, he got arrested. He said he was with his friends and the police stopped and said, have you ever been arrested yet? He said, no. And the police said, we need your fingerprint then. And just grabbed them as a young kid a minor took him to the police station and get him fingerprinted and released him. And that that was like, you know, and I was sitting there, it's like that was his first relationship with the police. And 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 those are stories you still hear today. You know, uh um like I, myself, I, I mean I cannot tell you how many times I've been I've been stopped for no reason. And I remember when uh, once I make a U-turn and the U-turn was like, you know, they stopped me and said, I made a suspicious turn. And I said, yeah, it, it was a U-turn. It's like, it is suspicious. I was like, what was suspicious about the U-turn? So that gave them like, you know, everything to search my car. And, and those, those happened to me when I was like, you know, start driving young, you know, uh, you know, 1920, not thinking about like, you know, all I was thinking is not to get in trouble. Yeah. You know, not thinking of like, you know, how everything, all my rights was being violated at that moment. So those are the relationship, you know, that starts with the police and, 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 uh, and it didn't come from the police. Like it's a, it's a systemic problem and, and how they view and that, that tr they choose to, you know, police black bodies and, in. France, can I say one more thing? Just 20 seconds. I know you're trying to keep, Please. I I think also too, it's it's complicated because with this whole discussion of policing and reform and abolition, there are, you may not, there are divisions within the black community because, you know, even with Walter Headley and his, you know, law, law and order and stop and frisk, they did like a poll where, you know, I think 40 something black folk, you know, strongly disagreed with his policy, but like 30 something percent believed that he was doing the right thing, right, in the black community because these communities are unprotected because of rising crime rates in the community. And so there's that discussion going on now too, where some feel like, um, you know, we, we need the police, right? We need them to, to protect our communities, but not to harm our communities. And others who are clearly saying, but, you know, even there are deeper issues going on that lead to some of these problems in, that we have in, in urban communities and maybe you know reimagining whether or not policing is the best way to address those issues. So I just wanted to add in that how Black people have encountered and think about police is also nuanced when it comes to um, historically, actually, in some cases, fighting fighting police brutality while at the same time wanting more police protection for their communities. And what a great segue because I think here in the remaining thirty minutes. Uh, and we invite, of course, questions, but we really want to turn this to the final. We obviously understand the, the gravity, the emotional burden, trauma that is that is uh, uh, that we've addressed in these police killings. 
that sentiment that it's only a symptom, but not the cause of some of these overriding, uh, you know, inequities. And then that final piece of the communities of color being over policed, but under protected. So all what needs to happen, what needs to change? And quite honestly, where from our lens, we are a public institution. We serve some public value and that therefore we must ask what is our role as a public institution to help bring about more equitable outcomes? Ultimately, it, it's, a, it's a big question, but um, I will almost maybe prime one or two uh, um, reflections that we had in the past. I know Dr. Patterson, for example, you really spoke of, of that sense of representatives, uh, representation and leadership. Um, you had even reflected on Delrish Moss. Uh, Terrence, you had at one point commented about the idea of community policing, you know, if that's feasible. But could you all kind of just speak to those points of where can we go from here and what role do public institutions play in helping uh, drive equitable and sustainable solutions? And I know it's a big one, so I'm gonna, I suppose, uh, start maybe with Dr. Patterson. I, I think I saw you come online, but ultimately take all the time that you may need. Right. So, so I don't think I, I don't think training is the answer, right? Because um, people say, well, you know, we need to we need better training. Uh, and I, 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 education, I would say, is is an answer. Right. Um, and so it's it's all about the relationships. And, you know, I, I, I listen to um, I, I, in my courses, I have had students um, examine um, Katrina in its aftermath in New Orleans, um, um, the, the, the murder of Michael Brown and, and the aftermath in, in, in Ferguson and um, also most recently uh, had them look at the examine the Flint water crisis, right? And 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 the goal is is to to identify lessons and strategies to ensure that the failures don't continue to occur. And so clearly there are problems. Uh, the the um, um, and Dr. Rose mentioned the, the Department of Justice report on Ferguson, right? Which is a a, a very informative and in, um, um, assessment of what's wrong, what went wrong with policing in Ferguson, and 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 so I always invoke Captain Moss, who's now with us, but who served as as the uh, um, the police chief of, of Ferguson, because he talked about how when when he became chief, one of the first things he did was he he went out and and went from door to door and introduced himself to the community, and people were like, "What?" You know, and that had never happened before. And so um, I think that that it's, it's I mean, we, we talk about innovation, right? That's the buzzword and design change. Those are the buzzwords. And, and clearly some changes need to take place um, with law enforcement and policing in this country. And, and so I, I'm, I'm since I've heard it mentioned so so much the, the past couple of days, the legislation that focuses on the George Floyd Policing Act, but, but this this um, um, excessive use of force, right? That 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 um, clearly something needs to be done. There need to be penalties. Um, um, there there need to be um, um, so there needs to be surveillance. There needs to be transparency. Uh, and, and that follows certain types of behavior across jurisdictions. And so um, I'd like to think that what, what happens here the, in, in the university's role might be again, the education um, to ensure in, in public policy and administration um, and, and even African, African diaspora studies, you know, this focus on um, ensuring that we, we, we expose students to um, content that, that um, examines inequities and, and, and barriers 
but also focuses on the importance of social equity, right? The, the importance of inclusivity, the importance of, of uh, eliminating these barriers that, that, that exist in, in communities. So um, this is sort of my initial comment. And if I may just, you know, the bite size right to pivot to you, Terrence, but education, monitoring, performance evaluation, those were some keys. Um, Terrence, did you want to, or, or anyone else want to yeah. comment? I wanted to, um, so Chief Naji, um, she was one of the first, she was the first um, female assistant chief here in Miami. And um, she, she made something very clear um, several months ago. There's a idea of policing and patrolling. Black communities are policed while other communities are patrolled. And I think if we're going to really take heed and look at everything, we must follow the data. Data decision, uh, data-driven decision-making is still um, a working um, paper to use, right? What can we learn from history? There's nothing new under the sun, they say. What can we learn from history? What was it that these black officers that rose from five black officers to 51 black officers, what did they do in these communities that allowed them to have such a strong presence and an impact, but also, also save lives, right? Also protect property, also make people feel comfortable to call the police. Where did Officer Friendly go, right? Um, we see a very, very good example, Dr. Rayshawn Ray, uh, the Brookings Institute um, does an, immac an immaculate uh, program um, looking at implicit bias. And I believe from an institutional standpoint as FIU, we need to look at how do we come into these places of employment, um, um, our students understanding their biases coming into these places, and then ideally finding out how we can help them maneuver Right? We may not be able to wipe them away, but how can you manage your bias? Right? I use the example all the time. You see a, a pit bull and you immediately fear, right? Because the media has put the fear in you about a pit bull. You see a chihuahua and you say, oh, it's just a chihuahua, right? But at the at the end of the day, that chihuahua can grab that ankle and your Achilles heel and you're gone, right? The Achilles heel is one of the most sensitive spaces on the body, the human body. Right, so I, I, I use that because our biases have been brought out by media. Obviously, we're going to need, and FIU has one of the most amazing um, psychology programs um, in the world, you know, and the, the training of the trauma that is going to need, be needed in these communities as a result of what we're experiencing, we need to look at that. So how can we get our universities into the communities and deal with the trauma? Right, so that doesn't become a repetitive situation. How can we deal with the implicit bias that happens in the police department, right? Here at the museum, just prior to COVID, we were offering training workshops around implicit bias and identifying it using the Harvard study. Um, and we did that because we really wanted our young people to know you're in a classroom with very diverse groups of people. Miami is one of the most diverse spaces in the world and we love it, right? But we also have ways that we've been brought up to think about people and, and perceive perception. And perception and optics sometimes challenge us when we get into making honest decisions about who we are. What makes a police officer draw their gun on a black child versus drawing a gun on a white or, or any other child, right? What makes them feel that fear? And so looking at those, I believe, will lead us to a better outcome. Do I believe it's just about policing? Absolutely not. We're dealing about a bigger system and we need to focus really on that state sanction way of you know offering you know violence and 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 and, and how we continue to protect that. You know, doing my job should not be at the at the hands of someone not being humane, being treated fairly. Um, through our LGBT community, we see it, you know, trans lives. Why are we continuing to experience this? When are we going to address this head on? And it's because of the fear that has been put out about people who are different than us, who show any difference or who not showing the norm. So um, that's my take. And, and I think FIU is doing a great job starting this conversation and then implementing things in communities 
all across Miami is the beginnings of making that change be a relevancy. And only to chime in to amplify what you have said, um, because you had you you really, as all panelists have shared some amazing things, but um, some takeaways that, that I got, Terrence, were in fact, of course, that anti-bias tra training and that trauma training, which, hey, sure that has a place in, in maybe all things police or state sanctioned, but we could probably use it at each and every every corner uh, of our lives, right? But also that important part, as I am uh, coming off of a public administration program, that historical administrative context of policing over time, not looking at it as a two-dimensional flash in the pan, but really that that overall three-dimensionality. So I, I wanted to amplify those, um, maybe turning to uh, either Dr. Patterson, uh, Dudley, uh, what would you say to that that question? It's a big one. Uh, of what is the community responsibility that we share as a state um, university system to help drive some changes uh, within the current frame? Uh, I, okay, let, let let me. They, um, the thing is is how the story has always been told. It's a university. How the university choose to tell the story and what they choose to put in their curriculum. That's what it is. And, and, and you know, as a university, like you have a his, you know, historical department, what books you want your students to read? What would you suggest? Because it's a bigger, larger issue. And you know, in the documentary, one thing I, I want to, I, like, if you're watching it, one thing I focus on is Mike Duffy's relationship with the city. Because to me, those issues are large. You know, that same issue, you can say, uh, Mike Duffy's relationship with the US or Mike Duffy's relationship to the Western world as a Black man. All of that you can see, that's what I was trying to say, his relationship, because it's a larger, I, I wanna keep saying that there's a larger problem we need to talk about because that relationship like, you know, uh, black people and brown people or indigenous people has with America is not, it's not what's being, you know, being told at the university. And there's a lot of scholars that like scholars, they, 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 like, they write a lot of great papers in a scholarly language that nobody else can understand and they don't want to dumb down for other people <laughs> which you know this is where it starts it's it's what the university chooses to put out there because that education starts with the university it's like institution from everywhere it's like what is in your curriculum how you choose to tell the story and what books you want to suggest to your you know to your students that's that's how I would, I would, uh, would say it. And, and those problems are ger generational problem. You will not see them get fixed tomorrow. It's, it's the, you need to get them start now. And you start them by like, you know, the next generation of students that's going to come in, what you're going to want to teach them. And I would just add to that, Dudley, that I think um, having, providing opportunities and spaces to bring in you know, organizations like the Dream Defenders or Black Lives Matter or other grassroots groups in South Florida, have them be a part, come to the table. What are they, you know, these are the people who are living these experiences, right? Who are um, encountering the police on a daily basis. What do local people in the community have to say about what they think is the best way to um, address what's happening. And whether that's, you know, and I know that I'm sure that they're, they're I, I'm not in Miami now, haven't had a chance to come back yet, but got my shot. So hopefully at some point I get to come home. But I mean, I don't know what, since uh, Floyd's murder, what kind of town hall meetings there's been between community and police. I'm sure there've been some, but I think if you're talking about other ways of, in addition to um, some of the suggestions that have already been provided by the panelists, bring, bring the people, you know, bring the community to the table, right? Listen to what they have to say about um, how they think 
uh, what they see as the real issues, right? Do, do they think police should be first responders when it comes to mental health or domestic violence issues, right? Do, do they think there needs to be other resources that are, um, you know, the, the, the space or the, the place that, that people go to uh, for assistance? What, what role do they think um, police should, should play? I mean, I think you have to go to where people are or bring them to where you are to get those other voices to be a part of this conversation. Well, and, and thank you so much. I, I want to just underscore and amplify what Dudley said and, and invite you in, uh, Dr. Patterson, but Dudley, um, take it, I'm taking ferocious notes over here, but curriculum, you really underscored. And I think there's a separate conversation, maybe a, a different hour long conversation about language, uh, but meeting people where they are, capturing the story, listening, and then asking what can best help you where you are, where we find you. So um, uh, Dr. Patterson, uh, same question, now moving over to you. No, I, I just what role to, could FIU play, state institution? Right, so, so it's, I wanted to just sort of follow up on, 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 on Dr. Rose's suggestions, right? And, and, and you know, we've, we've been doing um, that kind of programming and, and so it's expected, um, you know, I'm the, now the director of African African Diaspora Study, it is expected that, that we would be providing and offering that kind of uh, programming. And, and for, for me as a director, it's really important, right? Um, as a person who grew up in Miami, it, the community component is vitally important to me and is, is one of, of my primary goals or the difference that I wanna make as, as a director and, 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 and and that, but then to follow up on what Dr. Rose uh, suggested, but I think as a university, we should be a facilitator for community-driven solutions. Like it is not our responsibility, nor should we take it upon ourselves to, to, to be the purveyors of, 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 of all of the expertise Right, and that that the solutions have to be community driven, and so we need to be certain that we can facilitate um, venues and, and, and forums um, that bring um, um, where bring us as an institution, or 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 definitely bring communities and community organizations together to work through, and and we facilitate you know, where we can. And so I think that that's why the, the, the screening of When Liberty Burns in, in, in May and the Lyric is gonna be so vital and important, um, um, definitely for students here at FIU to have the opportunity um, to, to um, view the film. And, and so, so the other piece of that though, is, is that, so you would expect in African African diaspora studies, that, that these kinds of issues would be a part of the curriculum. But it shouldn't only be in African and African diaspora studies. And so that's why as a, as a, as a discipline, public policy and administration, you know, people who are on the front lines of delivering public service, we've incorporated social equity issues and the examination of, of racial equity issues into, um, into our discipline. But it isn't only public administration, it should be infused across university curriculums, regardless of disciplines, right? It should be infused. And so that's why the University's Equity Action Initiative, which you know, explored these issues and, and made recommendations for uh, incorporating um, um, equity discussions uh, uh, equity initiatives, um, inclusion, longing, uh, both within and external to the university, um, that that effort has been integral in, in, in creating now our diversity, equity, and inclusion unit that's, again, focused on these, on these issues. And to amplify your voice, Dr. Patterson, um, I have no more paper left because these are all great ideas. Ultimately, that sense of community investment doesn't always have to be dollars and cents. 
how can uh, we convene, facilitate, um, and really empower some community-driven solutions? Because we know those are going to be most sustainable. And then you you uh, mentioned about FIU, but in reality, right, higher education have to break down the silos within our, our academic lane, so to speak. Um, law, medicine, psychology, there are ample needs for intersectional studies, but also, as you said, between higher education and the communities that they serve. Um, and, and those are really important. I do know that we're, we're coming up on time. We have about five minutes. There's one or two items in the, in the chat box, but I think I want to maybe ask you a question and give each and every one about 90 seconds to, to plug yourself and, and close out. But ultimately, thank you so very much. We had two questions, and I think you really did answer them. One was about um, building a pathway to children in school. FIU can be a facilitator, not just the police department inviting a community or a town hall, but having more partners at the table. The other one is is... I have, I think we all have a lot to say about it, but only a few minutes about qualified immunity. I think we, by our friend, Dr. Carabayo, we might have to get Dr. Carling Vincent Robinson on to discuss that. Um, to honor you, to be graceful to your presence and your contributions, the amazingness that you have brought to this table. Please, could you all just take maybe a, a, mo a minute, 90 seconds, give us your last reflections, anything you wanna plug and uh, before we close out. Starting with uh, Mr. Dudley, we'll give you the final word. How about that? Um, Mr. Anyone who wants to jump in, but I guess Terrence, since you're right next to my right, yeah. if you had any final I'll thoughts. jump in, I'll jump in. Well, most I give everyone uh, <clears throat> the opportunity to come to the museum. We are back open. Um, so come see it for yourself. Um, I didn't cover a lot of the uh, letters and the memo letters, but we have some amazing memo letters that help to capture the um, essence of what policing was back in that day um, at 480 Northwest 11th Street here in Miami, Florida. Uh, I want to thank FIU for being courageous. Uh, courage is something that is very important when you're trying to address these very vulnerable spaces and especially in philanthropy. Um, you know, it, diversifying who's giving the money also sometimes determines how you give out the money and how do you give out the support. And so um, with that, this has just been a great, I hope we uh, continue to have these dialogues and um, find solutions that mean more. And, um, you know, I'm from, I'm in Jersey, so don't really have any particular uh, plugs as far as the events here, even though we have a lot going on, but I would just echo Terrence's point that um, thank you for inviting me. Thank you for, um, you know, taking up uh, this, this, this huge responsibility or initiative to really try and address these issues. And I just look forward to um, helping in any way that I can. And hopefully at some point actually being in Miami to be a part of some of the great things that you guys do and continue to do in the future. Well, uh, I think Delhi, Delhi's going to go last, right? You, you're going to you're going to close us out, right? So I, I'm just going to say that I I appreciated this opportunity for uh, participating in such an amazing panel and and again uh, experiencing another uh, uh, opportunity to learn more and uh, and I look forward to working with everyone <laughs> on the panel again and hopefully hopefully very soon. Well, I want to say thank you for, for having me. It was a great panel. I, I really enjoyed the conversation. Uh, and I look forward to see everybody, every, you know, everyone to come and see the documentary at, at the Lyric Theater. Uh, and also, um, I, I'm a, a communication director at MOCA, so we have a new exhibition that just opened, uh, Michael Richards, uh, Are You Down? And that's an exhibition that really addressed uh, exactly what we're talking about now. Um, there, like, you know, social justice. Uh, and, and also there's a great emphasis on the Tuskegee Airmen and in, uh, in his sculptures is a, he, he has life size sculptures. Uh, please come and see the show and you guys will enjoy it. And, and thank you again for having me. It has been an absolute pleasure. Uh, to amplify our voices, the voices of our panelists, our family members, our community members. Thank you so much for joining us panelists. Thank you so very much for joining us 
uh, FIU family, our larger community. Uh, at this point, I just want to reaffirm, we are all human. We all deserve dignity and grace and voice. And with that, I want to turn it over to Pam uh, Carmen, Pam Lopez del Carmen, uh, for your final closing thoughts. Oh, Pam, your your microphone may in fact not be working. Check it out one more time. You know what? It isn't. Can try to try to game it. Oh, there you go. Wonderful. Technology. It's going to get the point. best of us. Um, well, in my closing thoughts, truly, uh, thank you to our panels, Franz, you and I today, it's Earth Day, we're going to have to figure out how to recycle because we have gone through notebooks of notes today. Um, but just thank you to, to our attendees for being part of the, the conversation, to our panelists, thank you for your expertise, your wisdom, your knowledge, your shared experiences. Each and every one of you deserves all of your flowers, and we thank you for not only educating us, but to helping us to unlearn. Today, you know, I, I had to scrap my notes and my, my ending comments because as I heard, I just, today we've come together as a collective to discuss our history and our present, to be part of the living archive of our lived experiences and to come to an understanding that the cycles of systemic problems that we continue to witness are engendered in a collection of policy that disproportionately leads to harm and disparity. And we know that there's work to be done. So to our attendees, I challenge you and I remind you that it starts here with self-awareness and accountability. Because in the words of Professor Ibram Kendi, if we're not doing the internal work, then the institutional work is fundamentally set up to fail. And so to close, please remember to register for the free screening of When Liberty Burns at the Black Archives Historic Lyric Theater on Saturday on May 15th and Sunday, May 16th. The screenings are free and open to the public, uh, but seating is limited. Again, we're following CDC guidelines for everybody's safety. So please reserve your space through eventbrite.com. And again, thank you all. We'll see you at the next roundtable discussion hosted by the FIU Foundation and the FIU Foundation Office of Inclusive Philanthropy. Thank you all and enjoy the rest of your week.